Sabah al khair. Good morning to you all, Your Royal Highness, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to be part of this uh, exciting uh, and fruitful event. Thank you for giving me the time to at least uh, uh, share with you some of the things that are happening in the Gulf, but specifically in Oman, which is where I can speak a little bit more with, uh, with, with knowledge. Uh, uh, one thing I've learned uh, over the last uh, 30, 40 years of being in the business, that in order to anchor a crowd like this on something, uh, we better start with what we used to call the hard truth. And the hard truth is really areas where pretty much everybody is aligned. Very difficult not to be aligned uh, on, on, on these hard truth matters. Uh, and the first one is, I was just thinking, what are the things that I can sort of speak and start at least talking about? And the first one is, really, despite all the efforts that are happening around, and I know there is a lot of work going on to try and get humanity over to the moon or, or the Mars, or Mars, probably for the foreseeable future and for the generation of everybody in this room with probably no exception. I see no children here. This is the only planet available for us to live. There is no alternative planet. We can try Mars, we can try the moon, but this is the only place that is at this moment suitable for us to have a decent life. That's, I don't think anyone can disagree with that truth. The second one is and I can assure you, if there is anyone smoking at the corner of this room, before time, the other corner will feel it. Planet Earth is no different. If something happens in Europe, China will feel it. And if something happens in China, the Middle East will feel it. We created boundaries on the ground. I walk around with my passport, but I can assure you the clouds and the air does not have the same passport. It can move freely from one country to another. So it is a joint responsibility. We are all in this together. There is no one country that is going to be saved if everyone else goes down. And there isn't one country that says, we've got nothing to do with us. Let others solve the problem. So collectively, we have to work. This is not an area where we are competing with each other. We can compete for talent. We can compete for market access. We can compete for goods and many other things. What we cannot compete on is addressing the climate change. And if we have technologies that can be applied here, those technologies are equally needed elsewhere. And we should be sharing the knowledge, the technologies, and contributing to the efforts that are happening globally. It doesn't matter where it is. Yes, we concentrate and focus on our own emissions, our own uh, uh, sort of contribution, but it's equally important that the others are at the same pace. We, as human beings and as a planet, are as weak as the weakest link we have amongst us doesn't matter how strong the others are. Yesterday, I think yesterday, I, uh, I got the news that we were ranked by the recent environmental assessment as number 55 out of 149 countries. Great. We can go and celebrate it and have a, a, a joyful moment. But how bad are the other 100? And how bad is Mr. or Mrs. 149? And how big is their contribution? That's what we should be worried about the most, because we are as weak as the last one. Uh, so uh, that's probably the priest speech to everybody. The fact is, uh, what probably uh, real sort of essence of my discussion is really, what, so what are we doing? I mean, it's all very nice. We can stand up here and talk about what uh, good human beings should be doing. But it's what, so what is happening on the ground to translate your nice words into actions? 
can, we can all talk. Only few of us can actually do something and are doing something. So in Oman, we're tackling this, uh, this challenge on uh, four strides. The first and the most obvious one is the energy efficiency. The Gulf region, and Oman is no different, we are well known for being the most consumers of energy per capita. So on average, we're probably three or four times higher than the average consumption per capita. So we have a lot to gain by doing energy efficiency. The recent assessment we've done in Oman when we looked at few government buildings and, and other buildings as well, we can easily save between 25 to 30% of the energy consumption, easily. And that's by just introducing few, uh, few tricks. Yeah, energy efficient light, uh, thermostats that will control the temperature in the room depending on how many people are there or not there, uh, keep the room cool yeah, when there is no one there at all. Uh, uh, little cultural things even we do at home. Uh, I know people say it sounds like counterintuitive. If you're not in the room, you should turn the AC off. But actually, if you turn it off, it gets warm. And when you turn it on again, it consumes a lot of energy only to remove the heat that was created in the room. So keeping it at a very low temperature, just cool, is probably the most, I know it's counterintuitive, but it's the most energy efficient uh, way of, uh, of, of, of managing your power consumption. Uh, turning the lights off and so on. Up to 30% of energy can be saved. And we are embarking on a program. We're starting with the government because we have to lead by example. And of course, my own building is, is no different. Uh, so we're starting with a number of government buildings. We are assessing them as we speak. We do have an earlier assessment, but many things have changed. Uh, many, many changes happened in the government. So we're going back again to assess the government, and we are establishing a program to go after each and every one of them to address the energy efficiency using a partnership with the private sector. So the government itself is not going to do it. It's the partnership that we're creating with the private sector that will ultimately do it. And of course, the private sector is, is not a charity. The private sector ultimately is there to make money. Uh, so we are creating the mechanism for them to see where the value is and, uh, and, and also, of course, make money. We both do, uh, because we will save our energy bill and they will make a, a small cut of that saving, which is a win-win. And that's exactly how the relationship between the uh, the private and, and, and public partners exist. So that program is going to grow. It certainly started. Uh, the second one is, uh, is the decarbonization of the different industries. Uh, we have announced that Oman will be carbon neutral by 2050. I know when we announced, and I was the culprit, and I can be blamed for a lot of sins, including that one, but we did it with good intentions, and we had roughly ideas on how to manage the decarbonization for about 40, 35, 40% of the total emission. We didn't know how we address the remaining 50 to 60%, and I don't think anyone who announced a date, whether it's 2050 or 40 or 60, uh, have a, a clear roadmap for, uh, for exactly how they're going to, to address all the, uh, all the, all the uh, carbon emission. So we started with that, and we identified that our biggest problems come from four sectors. The first one, and it's no surprise, is industry. Uh, and so we're addressing each one of those industries, understanding which industry, what can we do about it, where is the technology that can help them, are they still competitive in the market if they start decarbonizing, and so on. Uh, and uh, we also unusually started at least putting on the table a discussion that not, not, not many people would like to have, which is what industry are we going to phase out completely? Because it no longer match our decarbonization drive, meaning an industry will probably just say, Thank you very much. It's been great working with you. But going forward, this is no longer the industry we like to entertain. And I'm not going to mention any names so that I don't get quoted saying 
we're going to be killing an industry. But there are industries that will be very difficult to decarbonize. And unless we find alternative solutions, we just have to shut them down completely. And that is a discussion that is not happening in many locations, but definitely in Oman, we put it on the table and said there will be industries that will ultimately be the casualties of these transitions, and we have to accept it and find alternatives for the GDP contribution and the employment that that industry is creating. Uh, the second one is power generation, and we have set ourselves a target of 30% of our electricity will have to come from renewable energy by 2030. We are well on our way. Last, night, uh, last time I've, I've checked, maybe a few weeks back, uh, that the total projects were execute, executed, executing, and currently on the market for, uh, for bids will probably get us to about 31% by 2029. Fantastic position to be in, because I know some of them will slip, and some of them will challenge, will be challenged. So 2030 is a comfortable position considering the projects that we uh, we are have executed, executing as we speak, or, or coming soon. Uh, the challenge, and this is where the partnership again comes in is on the energy storage. And we just had a discussion with NG on the energy storage. Uh, so unless we find a solution for a cost-effective energy storage, and that's where the private sector comes, uh, it will be very difficult for us to meet our 2040 aspiration of about 70%, and 2050 aspiration of 100% of our power will be generated from renewable energy. We can generate power from renewable energy tomorrow. But unless I can s store it somewhere, there is no point producing 100% during the day and then go dark and cold or, or hot, as the case may be in Oman in the evening. So we have to store it, and we are looking at multiple options. Battery storage is the most obvious one everybody talks about. And yes, it works, and we, we, we know how it works. We need to make sure we understand how it behaves in our environment. But we're looking at multiple other options, including, of course, pumped hydro. It sounds a little bit strange for a country that doesn't have rivers. Uh, you start talking pumped hydro, but yes, pumped hydro is one of them. Uh, uh, molten salt, even though it's not my favorite, people still bring it every time. Maybe they just want to get me excited. Uh, white sand is another one. Uh, we're looking into gravity storage. So we are exploring different options. We still have time. 2030 is when we need to have energy storage already active. The third one is the uh, oil and gas business. And uh, while many people don't like hearing this, we are not discontinuing our oil and gas business. But we will do it in the most clean possible way. Yeah, we will er eradicate our flaring, for sure. We have set ourselves a target of 2030, internally 27 is the date. Uh, we will be transitioning the power generated by the oil and gas sector from thermal to renewable. Uh, we will be using solar steam instead of thermal steam, and we have already experience in that area. We'll, uh, we work in very uh, uh, actively with our partners on replacing many of the equipments that we use. Fugitive emission is an area that we are addressing, uh, and we have set ourselves a target of zero fugitive emission by 2030. So we will clean the oil and gas business with the exception of not being able to remove the hydrocarbon or the CO2 from the hydrocarbon that we produce. And for that, of course, we need to go into the next level, which is so how do you start decarbonizing the, the users or the end users? Uh, which takes us to the fourth stride, which is, uh, which is mobility. And for mobility, of course, there's a lot of work happening on introducing EVs, but EVs itself is not 100% green. We need to go a little bit upstream, but EVs, hydrogen trucking, hydrogen cars. In fact, uh, four weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, we broke ground of the first hydrogen filling station in Oman, and hopefully before year end, we will be, uh, I will be taking at least the first hydrogen car to fuel it physically from that station. And that's the promise that we give to the country. So we will have the first hydrogen station operating in Oman before, before the end of this year. Uh, 
uh, including, of course, all the uh, EV chargers. In fact, if you, if you drive from Muscat, for those that are familiar with, with the country, Muscat, all the way to Salalah, you can comfortably drive your EV without an issue. There are filling stations along the way. We're targeting to install no less than 900 by 2030. That should be filling practically every filling station. And of course, all the homes, uh, for those who have EVs, and I'm one of them, you have your own electric charger. So that's the fourth one, which is the oil and gas. And that's decarbonization. That takes us to the next one, which is, so what about the future energy? Uh, great so far with oil and gas. Gas is probably going to stay a little bit longer. Oil may be declining slower. The, the date is not important. What, what is important is we know that we, we will be declining. Gas will stay a little bit longer, but we need to start working on the new energies. And for us, a country blessed with uh, solar and wind, the energy transition is all about hydrogen. Uh, and for that, we have, of course, done a lot of work over the course of 2022, 2023. We have signed to date eight agreements with international consortiums, different consortiums from different parts of the world, all the way from Japan to France in this case, and of course we have the UK as well. Non-American at the moment, but uh, we, are, uh, we are sort of trying to, to work with them. Of course, with the IRA, it's difficult to attract American companies, but uh, other, other consortiums or other private sectors are, are interested. We've signed eight. It is setting us very well to achieve our promised target of one million ton of hydrogen by 2030. In fact, if we count everything that we signed so far, even though it's still yet to break ground for the first one, if we count them all, it's about 1.5 million ton. Some of them will slip, and some of them will probably get out because it's just too complicated, too expensive. In order to do that, and, and, and I'm sorry, before I go there, uh, our target by 2050 is about eight, eight and a half million ton. Eight and a half million ton is the number that we announce. Actually, it consumes about 30% of the land that we have sanctioned as renewable energy uh, potential land. The, 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 the land that we have uh, allocated and assigned to the Ministry of Energy is uh, equivalent to about 50,000 square kilometer. That's quite a lot of land. We're not going to be consuming all of that uh, by 2030, not even by 2050. It will take some time. And again, it depends on the market. There, we need a lot of partnership with everybody practically in this room. Uh, we need the technology providers, all the way from the solar panels, wind turbines, wind blades, cables, digital, data mining, to the construction of building all of these things, we looked at the challenge of how much do we need by 2030. For the agreements we signed, we need to install between 40 to 50 million solar panels. I produce zero in Oman today. So we have to import and start producing anywhere from 40 to 50 million solar panels. That's a lot of solar panels to be produced and installed in one location. We need to install at least uh, two to 3,000 wind turbines. They are between 100 to 150 meters high. The wind blades, you just multiply it by three. That's about six to 7,000 wind blades of at least 70 to 90 meters <coughs> each. Transporting 70 to 90 meter, even if you bring it from any port, and there is only one port where we can bring those massive wind blades at, because if I go to the other ports, I'll have a much bigger problem to, 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 to worry about. It means we have to now start assessing all the roads that we built. Are they suitable for the long trucks of carrying 70 meters long wind blade? And how are we gonna carry 3,000 wind blade, uh, six, uh, sorry, uh, 9,000 wind blades in a span of about three years. Because by the time we take FID in 26, 27, until we are live and producing and exporting in 2030, there's not a lot of space, time-wise. So we have to be ex transporting a lot, which means we have to know where are the trucks, how long, what are the roads, 
which roundabout we need to break, which new road we need to pave, and so on and so forth. That's a lot of work. Uh, are the ports ready? Are the storage yards ready? And so on. Uh, we're also building pipelines for the transport of hydrogen. We're building many ammonia plants to convert the hydrogen into ammonia. We're also looking into building some liquid hydrogen plants, and we're working with technology providers to liquefy, that's straightforward, but also to transport, and that's the difficult part. How can we transport it and get it to the other side and degasify it, if I use that term? Uh, and, and of course, that's where the partnership are required. All of this will require partnership with, 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 the, with the private sector. Uh, and of course, if you start going upstream, so how many million tons of cement that you need to use and uh, cables and sand and uh, clinker and so on. And I know it's getting into the details, but unless you address the minute challenge, that's the one that will come and bite you when you're not expecting. So. Uh, we have a huge team just looking at all of these challenges. And we, only yesterday we set up the, uh, the uh, facilitation team from the different government bodies to make sure that at least the part that we're controlling, which is permitting and land and uh, roads and what have you, is on its way. Uh, we leave the, ch the remaining challenges to the private sector. Last thing we want is the private sector ready and the permit from the Minister of Energy or housing or the municipality or environment or the port or the defense is not ready, yeah, then that would be quite embarrassing. So we're putting everyone together in the same room and said this is a national project and everybody have to compromise and we have to make sure we get it executed. This is what we promised the world and so far Oman is leading and we want to continue on that and of course Leading doesn't mean we're competing, we are collaborating with everybody, our neighbors and globally. So really, the, what I wanted to pass as a message is, unless we all partner, unless we all collaborate, whether it's decarbonizing or transitioning to new energies or saving the electrons that we already produced and not wastefully, wastefully consuming it, and playing on the energy transition using whatever form or shape the energy, new energy is going to look like, yeah, unless we partner, it's not going to work. One country alone cannot solve it. One company alone cannot solve it. Only collectively we can address this challenge. It's a global challenge, not a, not a local challenge. Uh, we are blessed at least with uh, an opportunity to serve globally in this area, and we'd like to continue doing that. And uh, for that, I think I'll probably conclude. I don't know, I don't see the time in front of me, but I've probably mumbled enough already and it took my entire time. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening.